what is feast your eyes. There's a lot going on in frame upon here. the golden monster. I love gold. <laughs> Lala's gracing us with her presence. Not, You've got a golden monster. Not just gold, ultra gold. Well, damn. This is the Pokemon gold of monsters. Yeah. Particularly, I, I I wanted it because it looks like Pokemon Gold, and the old Zelda cartridges. Right now, we we have, this is like a sponsored Legend of Zelda monster ad here. Raid Shadow Legends, Legends of Zelda monster. <laughs> by Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild two, sponsored and endorsed by Monster Energy Drink. Please give us a sponsorship. That'd be great. Um, this is like the road to El Dorado that I'm embarking on. Uh, takes yeah. this new. Matter. I already tried it though. I mean, you want to call it Mountain Dew. It's pretty Aztec, a la the JoJo mask. It is. It goes with my uh, my Mayan calendar. I want to play tats. roundabout when I look at it. It does feel like. I'll be the roundabout. So what's it taste like? It tastes like a Red Bull. That's not what a Red Bull tastes like. It kind of like. tastes like a Red Bull. No, you're a liar. It kind of tastes you're like a, Red Bull. You're a. I've tasted this, and I'm gonna taste it again because that's After not what a few Red Bull tastes, tastes like. I was like, you know, this kind of is like what Red Bull tastes like. Oh, kind of. It tastes like Red Bull, right? Mm. <laughs> Think about Red Bull when you sip it. I mean, like, it has an under undertone of Red Bull, but it's so pineapple that no, I disagree. I disagree. It's a classic. Green apple or watermelon. I don't fucking know what this is. Anywho, we aren't here to review monster energy drinks. Uh, we, but they are good. Let us know if you want us to review monster. We should do a monster energy drink tier, tier list. Because we're probably the only people who've drinking enough variety drinking? of monsters. <laughs> drinking, yes. I've probably drank mm. enough monster variety to do a comprehensive tier list of Let's every monster. Just do monster. an energy drink tier list. That's what this video is now. True. Fuck it. Fuck. Fuck whatever the video was. <laughs> energy drink tier list. Whatever we're you doing thought it. this was. We're doing it's it now. Oh, the bonus list. episode. We're, we'll do that in the bonus episode. Ooh. We actually will because we're gonna record the bonus episode after this. Famous last um, words. Head on to Patreon.com/slash Vic and Hope if you want to see our Monster Energy <laughs> Energy Drink tier list All that we just came up with list. while recording this video. But this video isn't about that. The content doesn't stop. This is about Little Witch Academia. <laughs> The, the magic is believing in yourself. Yeah, so Studio Trigger, <laughs> you know them, you love them. Uh, Little Witch Academia, I guess the show came out in like, what, 2016? 2017. 2017? It feels like it's mm -hmm. older than that. It's so weird. Time flies when you live in a vortex where time isn't real. It's partially because, so Little Witch Academia, um, the show was made after, it was a, originally a, a short film was the OVA was for the, the young, uh, animator, yeah. young Animator Training Project. The Young Animator Training Project. Uh, it was a long time. I don't know what year that was. Oh, God. 2013 or 14? Yeah, it was significantly before the, the anime came. Because I remember seeing Little Witch Academia, the short, when it had come out. I thought it was really great. Um, I remember it being really epic. I haven't seen it since, so yeah. I don't really remember what it was like. I remember it being pretty tonally different from what the show ended up being. Yeah. Did you ever see the second OVA? Yeah, I did. Okay. I don't remember the what Magic happens, Parade but... <laughs> or the Grand Parade, something to yeah, that effect. They're more that like epic, the, right? Uh, secondary characters. I don't um, remember. It had like more of an overarching plot. I think Akko learns to fly at yeah. the end of the first one. I couldn't remember if it, how first much it OVA. resembled what it ended up becoming. I know Akko is probably a very similar character. Akko is like pretty the, similar. The All the characters are pretty there. similar, but what happens is obviously not canonical to what happens in the TV yeah, series. Yeah, you don't need to have seen them at all. No, it's just like those were what led to it being able to become a full show. Um, yeah, the show came out. 
We both gave it a gave it a whirl when it was airing. I watched uh, eight episodes yeah. as it was airing. I think we watched those together because we had seen all the same episodes. Maybe. So I think the two of us watched eight episodes together or individually. I'm not sure. I would bet in 2017 we we're probably watching them like together. <laughs> it's possible. We were, were we dating then? Like officially? In 2017? Yeah. yeah, we were. So we watched them together. We definitely did. Anyway. <laughs> Doesn't matter. Not really relevant. We digress. Anywho, yeah, I gave it a fair shake. Uh, wasn't super into it. It just didn't stick for one reason or another. Yeah, and I think now it's finally come full circle into, like, I'm in the headspace and we're in the right place to be able to watch it again and, like, and get through it, you know, and, yeah. and really enjoy it. I want to say up front, you know, it's a great show. Mm. Um, I I loved it. Is it my favorite show of all time? No. Is it trying to be my favorite show of all time? No, you know? And, and that's kind of, like, a lot of what I want to get into after we talk about the fucking what actually happened in the show. Because it's sort of the cultural reception and context to me are also very interesting. But I don't want to just go on about, like, studio trigger for 40 minutes, you know? Yeah. I want to actually talk about the show. Um, so, yeah. Uh, what was it about? What happened? <laughs> So, uh, Little Witch Academia is about a young witch in training named Akko. She's really passionate because as a child she was inspired by this witch named Shiny Chariot who traveled the world and put on these really impressive magic shows. And she wants to, uh, to become just like Shiny Chariot and bring people happiness through her magic. The only problem being she uh, has no aptitude for it. She has yes. no aptitude for magic. But damn it, she's gonna try. She's a big fail lord. Um, and it's, it's, it's quite comical. Oh, she can't do the magic. Oh, how, no! How did she get into this magic school? I have no idea. It's very questionable, well, like, what the public times, perception of magic is. They address <laughs> the the idea that Luna Nova, the school she goes to, was once very prestigious, but yeah. their standards have fallen quite a bit. Yeah. Now, why they let a non, like, a traditionally non-witch into a witch school, I couldn't tell you. I think Maybe they're like, really desperate. I don't know. I think the suggestion is that they're desperate and there's such a low demand that and they'll just low like, attendance. Fuck it, we'll yeah, try they'll, anybody. They'll kind of take anybody. I'm not sure which, how she like got to the point where she <laughs> Which is really could funny because you know? the barrier of entry to get to your first day of class is to be able to ride a broom and go through the ley line. Yeah. Which Akko has no idea how to do. Exactly. <laughs> And presumably that would be the gateway to like, oh, well, you couldn't make it to class, you drop out. Yeah. Like, that is established so that maybe, you can't make you it know, to class. So maybe, you know, they'll let you in, but you yeah. won't be able to make it to your first day, you're expelled. And the only way she's able to do that is by, you know, leeching off of her friends, which is her, her superpower, her really. Her superpower. Is, and, you know, it, it's kind of her specialty as it's developed over the course of the show is her, you know, she brings people together, she inspires them, and she's got her rambunctious do... The, you know, go get her attitude that always ends up. She's Ash Ketchum. Yeah. Like, I want to compare this. She fails upward. Like, if I were to make some big comparisons to, like, what this show feels like tonally and thematically, it's like, this is like Pokemon and My Little Pony <laughs> yeah. sort of combined. I would say That's fair. it's more like Pokemon in the sense of, like, being a Japanese kids show and kind of having the sort of tone and character of that sort of thing. There's definitely something different tonally from even Pokemon in My Little Pony. Yeah. Whereas, I don't know, I just feel like Pokemon, to me, has personally more of an appeal than My Little Pony yeah. ever did. So this show has quite a bit more appeal to me. And it's sort of like, me. I say My Little Pony because it's it's like the, the, the comparisons you can make with My Little Pony are sort of the, the world-building elements, the... Friendship the is magic. Friendship is themes, the, the theme relationships of the show. between yeah. all the girls. So it's like tonally, it's nothing like My Little Pony in terms of like the experience of watching the show. And sure, like yeah. My Little Pony is a show crafted for little girls in in America through a Western cartoon lens that has like very. It's got the trappings of like a kids show in the West, which is like. All of this flowery shit that you don't get in, like, yeah. in Pokemon, you know? Yeah, which We're, is to say it's going to be very surface level, yeah. very, you know. Whereas, like, Pokemon and My Little Pony are appealing to very similar demographics. They have a completely different tone. And you can't say that Pokemon isn't appealing to the same demographic as My Little Pony, because I loved Pokemon when I was 
five and six. That's when I loved it the most. That's when it appealed to me directly, you know? Like, yes, it can appeal to older audiences, as My Little Pony did appeal to older audiences, but tar target demographic, Ash is 10. Ash is 10 years old. Yeah. That is their target demographic with Pokemon. That's all I'm saying. I'm just jumping oh, ahead the, of the you argument. You mean in of the like, sense it appeals to it's appealing to children? Like in the in the like writing the show, the demographic in mind that is targeted is ten year old kid. You know. I think My Little Pony might even veer lower though. Yeah, it My Little Pony is definitely lower. Um, Friendship I would is say magic. Like five you know? to six. Yeah, I would say it's it's probably going audience. for a lower audience. So yeah, so tonally Pokemon. Little more mature, but it's a kid's show. That's what I'm trying to say. Like, they're kids' shows. I think they're different caliber <laughs> kids' shows, but yeah, they different are, caliber kids they're shows. for kids. Yes. Challenge me. I don't want to get too fucking Yeah, we don't, don't get in the weeds on that. that but, I, but I mostly want to draw a comparison with Pokemon because Akko is Ash Ketchum. Yes. In every sense of the personality. We're like, the, the overarching theme and message of Pokemon the first season is that Ash is the worst Pokemon trainer. He is shit. Every, like, there's sort of the iconography of Pokemon and sort of a, the, the Western take on, like, the messaging of it became, like, I want to be a Pokemon master and, like, we're gonna, Ash is the best, po is, he was never the best, he's the worst, that's the whole point, is that he's the worst Pokemon trainer and he's completely incompetent in every way. But, but his he attitude, to keep trying. yeah, and he he has the best connection with the idea of what it means to be a Pokemon trainer and what it means to be someone who's like making that sort of forward progress for the betterment of Pokemon kind. You know, it was his Shonen Harto. And so Akko is representing that in that she is the worst magician possible, but she understands like the fundamental appeal of magic more than anyone else and she's better than like witches who are yeah. like so steeped in tradition and have lost sight of exactly. like what makes magic special and made people love it and the overarching like plot theme of it of is is like yeah people have lost track of why they need magic. Technology a, yeah. has replaced magic in this Technology's world. replaced magic. There's lots of, like, old, crotchety political guys being like, magic is useless, it doesn't matter. And so Akko understands more than anyone, like, how to reignite the love of magic. Because it's, it's kind of like the love of art. It's like, you don't need art, you know? Yeah. Like, it could go away. It's it's all emotional appeal, and, and that's its utility, is bringing people together and inspiring them. So, like, magic could be a metaphor for art in this circumstance, and also a metaphor for, for Pikachu. You don't really need well, Pikachu, but, like, you know, I'm, and, <laughs> that's a stretch. I'm joking. Akko also has a... Her desire is framed differently than a lot of the other witches, because she wants to target her appeal of magic to non-magic users. Yeah. Whereas the witch community in the show seems very insular for the most part, and they yeah. really only care about impressing each other and, like, important people who have money. Yeah. Not, like, a common person who would find joy in magic, but maybe not necessarily monetary value. Yeah. And so, in the end, she's the perfect beacon for forward progress because she's thinking about things in terms of, like, how do I keep and preserve, like magic in its purest form in terms of like it's more important for this thing to exist at all than it is to exist within the confines of your like insular community you know right when you ascribe traditions onto it they Rather they value yeah it. they value the traditions more than they value the thing itself and they let magic die to preserve the traditions yes. that surround it. They're, which is they not are very much thinking. willing to let magic fall into the background of society to maintain what they think magic should be rather yeah. than uh, let it d be diluted or lose, uh, lose its purpose that they think it's intended for and let more people enjoy it and find it useful. Yeah, and without getting into spoilers, season two, kind of the, the main antagonist goes sort of against Akko. It is like the, she, she wanted the power to change. Like there's the, supposedly the end goal here is that like the, the staff that Akko has will unlock the ability to change magic yes. fundamentally or, or fundamentally alter the change world. magic yeah. and the way the world interacts with magic. And so like the, the villainous interprets this as like, Oh, I can use it to like, She's she's gonna use it nefariously to you know she they have she's the same goal of going reigniting about it in the magic wrong way. yeah but yeah. she's going about it in like the wrong way and in terms of being like I'm the strongest and I'm the best at magic so I deserve this power but it's not about you know who deserves the power and like how you think you're gonna use it it's about the person who understands like where magic needs to go 
getting that power yeah. and not even wanting it, you know? It's a classic yeah. literary trope, but... Of course. And, like, you know, the, the villain is willing to to hurt people and use their their negative emotions and, uh, like, engender engender negative things in people in order to get that power, whereas Akko is, of course, not willing to do that. Yeah, because it's about the power and not about uh, the results of, like, what happens with that power. Yeah, yeah. not the betterment of society, just the continuation of magic existing and being used for science and uh, crazy shit. But now we have all sorts of power. Yay! Yay, in the end. Uh... This has become very, uh, <laughs> the discussion, as it always does, has expanded and exploded. Um, yes, yeah, so it's broken up into two seasons. Yes. Uh, season one is pretty much just episodic adventures. Yeah. And you get to get a little character development. You get to know all the main girls. So, you yeah. know, you spend time with Akko and uh, Susie and Lote, who are her two main best friends. You meet a couple of supporting characters at the school. You meet all of her teachers. Um, I will say, like, one thing I really appreciate about this show is there is no A1 same face bullshit here. Oh, yeah. Every character is unique. Every character, you look at them, you can read what they're about, you, before they even speak, you, like, you get it. You're like, alright, yeah, I get it. And they're all, like, cute and cool, and there's obviously so much care and attention put into making every character an individual. Yeah. And they, they have a great thing where it's just, like... Each individual character only ever gets one episode of, like, backstory and fleshing out, but, like, in that one episode, it perfectly gives you who they are and makes you love them, even when it's, like, deep into season two, you're finally learning about, like, the mechanic girl, and she gets her own episode, but it's like, that was a fucking awesome episode, and then after that, you're like, oh, I love Constance! She's always just kind of been around, and you didn't really get it. First of all, she never speaks, and she's hardly around, so you hardly know anything about her until her episode. Yeah, which uh, can hit and miss with some of the characters, because someone like Susie is a fucking great character. Uh, so awesome comic relief. Just a, a joy every time she's on screen because she's so much fun. Um, but she really doesn't get to do much like through all of season two. Yeah. She gets her I mean, episode in season one where she, they go into her head and it's like the, the Teen Titans Raven episode kind of um, where they're reading all the different sides of Susie. But like she's not developed after that at all. Well, being the comic <laughs> relief character and like the snarky pushback to Akko, she yeah. can't change but so much. But she... At the, at, the, at the beginning, she is perhaps a little antagonistic towards Akko, but yeah. it becomes, like, a loving uh, kind of antagon- antagonizing, yeah. like you would do towards a friend and not, uh, genuinely not giving a fuck yeah. if Akko <laughs> did fuck It's up. like her, her arc makes sense and the character is great and everything's fine. It's just kind of like, from season one, you kind of have, like, the main three, mm-hmm. like, trio, and they're always getting into shenanigans, and it's, it's them kind of versus everyone, and then in season two, it sort of transforms into everyone is on Akko's side, yeah. but you start to lose, like, the three, you know? It, kind of, it yeah, becomes they, more they about Akko and, like, the, the bigger players, which I guess it inevitably was gonna, you know, right. go there, but... I guess, like, I could have had another 13 episodes of just random adventures with the main three, and it would have been fucking great, and yeah. I would have had no problem. But uh, season two definitely gets into the, the plot of the show a lot more. Yes, which, so the overarching plot of the show is, of course, you know, Akko, she sucks at using magic, she's, she's no good, but she inherits a shiny chariot's rod, her wand, yeah. And you come to find out uh, through the guidance of her teacher, Ursula, that she needs to unlock these uh, seven magic words in order to access the Grand Triskelion, yeah. which is the thing that allows you to change the fabric of magic and how it interacts with our world. Mm-hmm. So that's the overarching, like, once you yeah. settle into the school, you introduce all the characters. I would say from episode, like, two, you know that Ursula is shiny chariot. Oh, it's fucking like, obvious. Yeah, you're not meant to be like, who is this mysterious woman? It's like, yeah. It's chariot. But, uh, Who's that Pokemon? Like, it's it's great that they set that up as a big endgame twist that, like, we already obviously know, and it, it, it knows that we know from the beginning, and yeah. it lets us know pretty early on, like, blatantly who she is, but Akko doesn't know. 
and that's because still Akko the, is oblivious. the motivating factor, but they still deliver a really great twist towards the end yes. why, by giving us the full kind. Because you're the whole time you're wondering like, how, why did she become a teacher when she was like this great sort of celebrity, Performer. you know, yeah. from Akko's perspective? And there's like a trading card game, and she's got like the beautiful cards and stuff, and it's like she's clearly this legend. Why is she teaching? And we don't have everyone the rest at the, of the school context. has a negative opinion of Chariot, and you're not yeah. really sure why for quite a while. And most of the faculty does doesn't seem to know that she is Chariot. Yeah, like, she seemed to has she's hidden her identity and completely changed yeah. her appearance, her name, everything. I think the the head master knows. Maybe. But I don't think the other teachers know. Yeah, there're definitely some teachers who don't seem to know yeah. um, that she is Chariot. And so it's like most people aren't even calling this into question until late into season 2 of like who the fuck she actually was cuz uh she claims to have been a student who attended the school. Um, even though there's no record of her, which you'd think would be very obvious and which, quick yeah, to figure out. Which, yeah, you would think everyone would be like, that's weird, huh? Huh, there was never a student here named Ursula. We don't find this out until fucking <laughs> deep no in here. No worries. It doesn't matter, it's not a big deal. Um, but yeah, I guess we should get into spoiler territory. Um, broad recommendation, it's great. If it, if what we've discussed, so, like, that's why I wanted to talk about, like, how it's, like, Pokemon and My Little Pony and shit, because, like... Mm. I want to give a recommendation for this show and say it's great, but with while giving you the understanding that it's not Gurren Lagann and it's not fucking, you know, it's not like this epic, crazy thing. Like, I want you to go into it with the expectation of, I'm watching Pokemon, you know? I don't want you to go into it with the expectation of something that it isn't and then think it's going to be cooler than it is, you know? I think in a way, <laughs> being a trigger show has become... A curse in and of yeah. itself, and that's what because I because everyone I'm expects to. every show that Trigger makes to be a Gurren Logan or a Kill a Kill. Yeah, and clearly that's not what they want to do every time. And every time they don't deliver on that, people get upset. Yeah. So I would say don't you know don't come into this show with that expectation of it being. You know the trigger show, yes. Gurren Logan, Kill a Kill. Because the, like the the history of this is that you know. Imaishi worked for Gainax. Right. He made Gurren Lagann at Gainax. He directed that. He made other stuff before that. It was all fucking crazy as fuck. Gurren Lagann was actually the most tame shit he had made until then, but it gets big and epic and amazing. Everyone loves Gurren Lagann. Uh, Imaishi, I don't know if he started Studio Trigger, but he's like the head of Studio Trigger, I guess. And he directs Kill a Kill, Studio Trigger. Kill a Kill is a lot like Gurren Lagann, but kind of turned up to 11 with like goofiness and insanity. Um... Even you said Yoyoshi Nari did Panty and Stocking, right? Yeah. Because that was around the same time, one of the early Trigger things, Panty and Stocking, crazy, vulgar, insanity, turned up to 11. So like, Panty and Stocking may still have been Gainax. I think that was still Gainax, yeah. Yeah. Either way, Panty and Stocking is sort of wrapped up in all of this, but uh, yeah, that's crazy, absurd, crude. Very in, crude. Yeah, insanity. So it's like, their, their early works set up this expectation of like this style that Trigger became known for, even though Trigger had only done Kill a Kill, you know, like it establishes this. But because all the same players them, are there, yeah. there's a certain expectation of the studio. So very quickly, expectations for Trigger became that way, and so, like looking back on it in retrospect, it's like they haven't done tons of shit in that style, you know. Yeah. It's, it's like Promare is yeah. adjacent. And I think Pro Promare, Promare, yeah. whatever you Pro want to say, I think it's fair to. <sighs> to lump Promare in with those things because it is going for the same kind of style. It is directed by Imaishi doing another Gurren yeah. Lagann with a lot of the same See, themes and aesthetics as Gurren Lagann. That's a completely fair comparison. Yeah. But then to take Little Witch Academia or BNA and, and, and try to compare those two, you're yeah. comparing two di completely different animals. Mm-hmm. And it's sort of when you go into something with, a, with an expectation and you get disappointed because like, oh, I thought Studio Trigger could do, you know, I, I want Gurren Lagann again. I want Kill a Kill again. And Studio Trigger's not giving me those things. So I'm really disappointed in their their other shows. It's like, well, just just because it's made by the same studio doesn't mean you should go into it with those sorts of expectations. Yeah. Like, you don't go into every A1 picture show wanting Sword Art Online. You know, you don't go into every fucking... <laughs> PA Works show expecting Shiro Bako. Like, that was an, a crazy outlier in terms of their lineup, you know? Well, and here's the <laughs> thing, because, like, I feel like if you if you box a studio in 
and you say, okay, you made this thing that I really like, and I want you to just make things like that from now on, you end up with, like, a Marvel. Like, it yeah. becomes a Marvel Cinematic Universe where everything becomes such the same formula, same style, same aesthetic, that there's nothing special about any of it, really. Yeah. And then, to me, it's like, you come at it and you, you be like, oh, these are, like, Trigger's mid-level shows. BNA and Little Witch Academia, uh, they're kind of... They're mid-level shows for Trigger, but Trigger's mid-level show is better than A1 Pictures' best show, you know? In a given (laughs) season, look at everything that came out next to shows like this, and, like, the appreciation you have for how unique it is, and, like, the care, and at least the effort that someone went through to make something different that wasn't fucking some isekai, yeah. some high school anime, you know, like, the boilerplate shit that comes out a hundred different shows every season. And in the end, like, it, it feels really timeless when I when we watched it, where it's just like, I feel like this could have come out anywhere in the last fucking 30 yeah. years, and it would have been pretty similar, and, like, it has its own style. I think it's gonna age incredibly well. Absolutely. Because, like, you could, if this is on Netflix, any kid... In 10 years could watch this on Netflix. They wouldn't know how old it is or where it's from or what the fuck's going on. It's completely timeless because it's doing its own thing, carving its own path, with its own world, and its own aesthetics that are beautiful. Yeah, they they put in the time and the effort. They gave a shit. And it's, it's a great show. It's just not, it's not Gurren Lagann, you know? And it's not trying to be, like, it didn't set out to be anything like that. It set out to be pokemon with mages you know i don't know what their intention was but like it it doesn't feel like they're trying to go for anything similar to what those other shows are if you take it on its own merit it's a fucking great show you know let yo yo shinari make his kids shows let him do it yeah let him make his shows for kids damn it let him (laughs) let him do what he wants and like bna has its problems and you know i could talk about those forever but it's like i feel like if people like the the hype around bna when that was coming out it looked like it was going to be a a more triggery imaishi style thing even though like we knew who was directing it we knew kind of what to expect and then people kind of put this expectation on it and it's like if you compare it to little witch academia bna is like that, it's pretty similar in yeah. tone and style and everything, and it's, Even and in, it's like, a great show on its own merit. Character archetypes. Yeah. there's a lot of similarities between BNA and Little Witch Academia. And I think there's problems with BNA because I think it needed to be 24 episodes and it yeah. only got a certain amount. BNA didn't get enough time in the oven, which Little yeah. Witch Academia has the benefit of having that two core run. And from Yo Yoshinari's perspective, I think he really didn't gel right with the writer, who mm. was the writer of Kill a Kill and Gurren the God. And he likes to write things that are different from what Yo Yoshinari seems to like to direct. And so I think they clashed heads a little bit. You, I mean, it's very clear if you read interviews with them that it was like they that Yo Yoshinari was not happy with the direction of the story. You know, yeah. um, I don't know how much got fixed or whatever, but it seemed like in the in the production that that was an issue. So, like, yeah, you can criticize... Like, there's places to criticize b and I'm not saying that, that criticisms are invalid because of the previous statements we made about generalizations about Trigger, but I do think that a lot of people go into it expecting something like Gurren Lagann, and what they got was something like Little Witch Academia, and they were really disappointed. Put your expectations away. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, you just have to assess it for for what it is and not put it in that frame of Gurren Lagann, you know? Yeah. Like, let it go, guys. It's okay. Anywho, going onward. Moving on. Spoiler Moving time. On. It's spoiler season time, two. baby. Um, shit really picks up in season two, plot-wise, because we get the introduction of a new professor. What was her name? Croy. Croy! Fucking LaCroix. Yes, LaCroix. Professor LaCroix comes in. And she's fucking cool as shit. She's got a haircut. <laughs> she does um, have a haircut. Yeah, Ursula goes away for an episode. They they find a reason to get rid of her so that Croy can come in and no one knows who the fuck she is. Yeah. And she becomes a new professor and she's gonna pave the way to the future with science. She's a technomancer. Yeah, she's a fucking technomancer. They're, uh, so fucking... the, the crisis at the school is essentially they have a philosopher's stone that provides magic to the witches and all the magical yes. beings that are on campus. However, the philosopher's stone is becoming like basically weaker and weaker. Yeah. It's not providing enough magic for everyone on campus to use. And so they're having this huge energy crisis to which uh, Croy comes into the situation and she's like, 
All right, well, I have a solution. I have combined magic and technology, and through this, we can harvest, like, energy from the ley lines and all this shit, and I give you all these little routers, so you have magic yeah. power, portable, carrying with you wherever you go. You never have to worry about running out of magic. Everybody wins. It's a perfect solution. Yes. Which it was at the time. It was pretty good. At the, I mean, at the time. Yeah, but we quickly learn uh, that Croy... And Ursula, a.k.a. Shiny Chariot, have some sort of history together. <sighs> and, and Shiny Chariot does not trust this bitch at all. She's very much like, oh, fuck, it's Croy. Oh, God, this is going to be bad. Um, and throughout the course of season two, we get lots of interactions with Akko and Croy because Akko thinks she's the coolest person ever. Um, partially she loves how competent she is. And, and like, from Akko's cool, perspective, know like, everything appearance. Akko has trouble harnessing the power of magic, and Croy has created ways to use the power of magic taking, like, the mage out of it and in, in using science. So it's, yeah. I, I see the appeal to Akko of, like, oh, this could help me progress, you know? Because it, it could help her discover her magical abilities or whatever. Mm. Um, I just got sidetracked because I wanted to talk about uh, Akko as a character and how fucking <laughs> incredibly shitty she is through, like, all of season one because, like, that's the point, you yeah. know? It's obviously the point. The point is, she sucks. Because, uh, you know, her personal growth journey is going from being, like, ridiculously selfish to uh, yes. ultimately She's learning uh, super bullheaded super selfish ways. super self-centered totally just fixated on what she wants and how to get yeah. it there's a big commentary on privilege which i guess we can get to because uh with the um the rival character diana diana is sort of, you know, the opposite of Akko. She's the, the ace student in school, and she's from a rich... Uh, she's from a very prodigious witch family. Yeah, like the most prestigious the witch Cavendishes. family of all. The Cavendishes. Oh, <laughs> she's the coolest. And so she's poised as, like, the Gary or the fucking, you know, the classic snooty rival. But I think that's not fair, because Diana is, like, never a bitch. Yeah, she she's is. She's very competent and very smart, and she calls Akko out on her bullshit, but she's never needlessly mean to anybody. She never, like, talks yeah. down to anybody. They well, go out of her way to make her, like, never the villain. So there's there's an interesting aspect with, with that, where it's like she's... They obviously set her up to be perceived as the villain, and what she ends up doing is she does enable bad actors... Because she's so popular. She has, like, the, the, the two girls who follow her everywhere. Yeah, she has two toadies. And they bully the fuck out of Akko. But when they <laughs> do it in front of her, she stops them. Yes. They, so they do like, it when she's not looking. But she's not exact. Like, she doesn't exactly say, like, you shouldn't be doing this. Well, you know? yeah, but, like, that's also not really her job. Yeah, but it is. Because to an extent, she does admit later that she hated Akko at first. Yeah. Because of who she was. So, so I do perhaps think, passively like, she was yeah, allowing she was them to She was passively that enabling way. it because she does think Akko deserves, deserves it. it. She's just not going to do it herself because she feels guilty about it. Yeah. So I think there's a lot of complexity to her there. I don't think she was, like, being super good, you know? It was like... No, I'm not saying she was, she was conflicted, perfect. But I like that she was she's conflicted. never... She's never that, like, fucking... Looking down her, your nose, like, fucking evil, yeah. pretentious well, she bitch. Was, she'll show you up and then be very calm about it and be like, mm, you know? And, and be smug. <laughs> Real Like, her smugness tactic. cuts into you, where she'll show Akko up in a way. If I don't where... get mad, then I've won the debate. Yeah. And Akko is, like, she projects an insane amount onto her yeah. in terms of, like, her vitriol. But then in the end, it's like she was... there. It was a two-way street that we didn't get to see until later when... when Diana admits to it, where it's yeah. like, yeah, they, there they are were both with Diana yeah. later on that put it into perspective. Exactly, which is great. Yes, which so, I uh, love. They took that character and like that archetype and like yeah. did something with it that was and actually they, really impactful. They they sent it to where it should logically should have gone, where it's like it justifies the way she acts by looking at her history and looking at like who she is, how other people perceive her as being from this rich family or whatever. And it's a perfect contrast to Akko because to Akko, Akko just perceives her as, oh, rich girl from magic family obviously is just predisposed to being amazing at She's magic. She's clearly just born God tier. And I feel like we learned kind of early on that, like, obviously she works really, really she tries hard. Really and that's hard, why she's yeah. really good at magic. But we continually learn more and more about, like, she really works hard. And that's why she's really good at magic. Yes. Because uh, she was also similar to Akko in the way that she uh, 
was especially shitty as magic when she was a little girl. Yes. She had no magic aptitude as a kid, and she had to work really hard to get to where she is now. Yeah. As an aside, I think it's really funny that uh, Akko and Diana are basically Michiru and Pink Dog Girl from BNA. Yes. They're basically the yes. same characters. <laughs> pretty much. Um, pretty similar. It's, yeah. There's twists, but, like, the, it's the same. They're they're pretty Pretzels pretty is the similar. Same. <laughs> I mean, Akko and Diana have a lot more time to get fleshed out yeah, and are, well, are much better in that but regard. But at the yeah. core of what those characters are, yeah, because like Diana gets to have like she didn't even you know she has a like a change of heart and it's in way less of like a forced way because she gets yeah. to sort of learn over a very long period well, of time. Yeah, there's so much time that yeah. we get with them. And Akko gets to have these great moments where she shows Diana who she is. Yeah. And, uh, and, and Diana they can come to friendship. terms and see, oh. And Akko gets to see, like, it's really the the crowning progress for her character is learning about Diana and how much work she put in because then <laughs> Akko could reflect and go, oh, I haven't been putting in any work. Right. Because Akko is the, is the type to... And she I likes to see she's to been working hard, but really... <laughs> well, what, uh... it, what she's been doing is thinking hard. <laughs> yeah, like, there we go. She is so preoccupied with, like, she wants to work hard. She knows she has to work hard, but she doesn't really understand what that means. And it's kind of like kids studying, and, like, I relate to this a lot, yeah, okay. where it's like, you, you know that you need to get better and people are telling you you need to do this. And so you sit down to do it. And then like, she's so bad at the act of like studying and trying and she doesn't understand how she's going about it wrong. There's no one teaching Ursula's her properly. Ursula's not good at guiding like, her to the appropriate way yeah. to work hard. And she's not good at the grind. And so it's, and she expects fast results where she thinks like working hard means oh i worked hard that one day yeah. you know <laughs> i it's it's like a it's a sprint for her it's like she does yeah. that 100 meter dash and she's like all right i'm ready i should be able to fly now let's go let's go yeah and she she wants those quick results and she spends way too many time w way too much time cutting corners yeah where it's always like damn working hard is it's really hard. difficult <laughs> there's got to be something i can do to expediate this process. And, like, most of season one is her doing that. Of, like, shit. Cutting corners uh, and getting fucked. And a lot of the times it will result in her, like, helping someone or doing the right thing in the end. But it's usually motivated by... her into that Yeah, hole. by ultimate self-interest in, like, yeah. being a complete selfish fucking idiot. <laughs> and not understanding, like, how useless she's being. And, and how, how much of a burden it is on everyone else around you when you are complaining all the time. And... Because she's taking it for granted that, like, she thinks everyone else just gets this better than she does, yeah. you know? She thinks that they just magically are competent and didn't put in the work that she is trying to put in. It's like, no, everyone put in this work. Like, yeah. you, if you look at someone next to you and they're more talented than you are, you shouldn't think, damn, it must be nice to be born with such fucking amazing talent. You should be thinking, damn, they must have really worked hard to... Uh, you know, to obtain, obtain this that. level of skill. And sometimes it's, you know, sometimes people are just fucking Some great, people you know? naturally have higher aptitude, sure. And by the end, it, it, almost, not... it almost invalidates that <laughs> by the end with, with the twist, where it, it turns out that, like, she really did have less magic in her to be able to do these things. Yeah. But you can still draw the comparison with Diana, who had the same starting yeah, set. Yeah, because you have two players yeah. starting from the same place, and yet one mm -hmm. of them rose up and the other did not. Yeah. And you could say that... Diana was able to rise up due to a certain level of privilege because she was in a magic family. She had all the resor resources at her disposal to be True. able to learn that stuff. Akko does acknowledge that she was fucking around, not doing anything most of her life and just like jumping on a broom and being like, why can't I do this? Which I understand in terms of like, this is sort of like my perspective on going to college where like a lot of your life you think like, I'm going to go to college and learn this thing. And you don't think about the fact that you should be learning it already and then go to a college and enhance that knowledge that you already have. Yeah. Like for me with filmmaking, it was like, oh, when I go to college, they'll teach me everything I need to know, you know, and then I'll be able to go and work. And you, because you don't understand like the sort of level of effort and thought that goes into these sorts of things, you just think like, this is what people do with their logical path in life. I'm going to go there, they're going to teach me, and then I'm going to be good. Yeah. So Akko, growing up, is thinking, I'm going to go to this witch academy, and they're going to teach gonna me teach how, to, me be how to be a witch. And then I'll be a witch. Yeah, she never thought, I need to learn this on my own to get to a level 
where I can go to the Academy to learn to be a witch. She just thought I'm going to go here, like, emblematic with she couldn't fly to school on the first day. You were supposed to already have known that. Right. There's you a were... baseline you need to know before you can even get into the school. Yeah. So you have to be self-motivating to learn this shit on your own, which Diana did. She's self-motivated to learn all this yes. shit. But through the lens of she had the privilege to know that these things even fucking existed when Akko had no, not, like, being yeah, from not a magic family. Yeah, she had less context. She had no context. So it's, but, you can't totally blame her, because I think if she had more context, she she, she would have made a different decision, but maybe. she didn't self-motivate at all. You know, yes. there she might have been able to find that information if she tried. And Diana <laughs> has her own obstacles. Like, her mom dies. She's living with her fucking shitty aunt who yeah. wants to just put her down all the time. She's got the stresses of knowing she's going to have to inherit the family name. Yeah. Like, she's got a lot going on as well. Yeah, she's got a lot going on. I'm not trying to say that privilege makes her, like, not as cool. You know, yeah. it's just like... But she does, she does come from a position where all of that information is is in her hands to be able to better herself where Akko did not have access to any of that. Yeah. And it, it sure. doesn't really acknowledge that in the show. And the fact that like, like I don't want to be too hard on Akko for her not trying growing up because she, there's no way that she could have known yeah. what she was supposed to She couldn't to do. even know what resources to, to yeah. try to find to start. Now it becomes a problem when she gets into the school and doesn't recognize that she's starting from a lower position than everyone else and is kind of blaming them for her yeah. not being good. And it's like, well, you can be lesser, just acknowledge, like, yeah, it's not your fault you didn't have access to this, but now you have the, ch now you have the opportunity you can learn and you're kind of cutting quarters around that and you're not doing it, right. you know? You're just like, well, why am I not getting it? Rather than asking a teacher for help, like seeking yeah. seeking guidance from teachers. Like Ursula comes to her yes. and says, I'm going to mentor you. Rather than her approaching a teacher and being like, hey, I'm really struggling. I'm starting from a lower place than all yeah. these other students are. Can you help me? And there's the, like, th throughout season one, it's sort of, yes, most of the faculty is putting Akko down all the time, mm. but Ursula is saying, like, let me mentor you, let me help you, and then Akko will, like, go, no, oh, I'm, I'm going to go do this. Out. And she doesn't take the the help she goes and in, goes into whatever crazy direction her mind takes her of like whatever shortcut she can yes, take. Yes, she whatever <laughs> whatever shiny chariot card she thinks is going to give her the shortcut to being a witch. Yeah, and she thinks because I'm the most like shiny chariot, then I will be special like she was. And she takes for granted shiny chariot's effort into being special. You know, she just thinks shiny chariot was just it's this godchild who could do no wrong <laughs> exactly. and it just was great. Well, you know, because she idolizes her, and that's yeah. what you do when you put someone on a pedestal. You know, they're and she's they 12, are perfect, so it's like... and she's a child. Yeah, like literally a she's child. 12. I think Akko is the embodiment of uh, not working hard in Hong Kong, but thinking hard in Hong thinking Kong. Thinking hard in Hong Kong. <laughs> I'm, it's so me growing up. I'm just like, if I think about getting better, <laughs> I'm just going to put so much thought into self-improvement that I will improve. Definitely, yeah. <laughs> God, why do I suck so much? I just got to figure out how to self-improve. How can I suck less? I just need to think my way into being a better person. Oh, man. She's great. This one makes her a great character, you know? And Akko is a great character. Through like, learning about is... Diana, she gets better. And then she goes like, oh, I haven't been doing the work. I do need to do better, yeah. you know? Because, like, a character like Akko can become annoying very quickly. Oh, yeah. If it's not handled correctly. But Akko is handled really well in a way that, like, when she's acting that way and through the time she's, like, figuring it out, it is, like, charming and you mm -hmm. still like her. And then when you figure, when she figures it out and, like, grows, you're, like, proud of her. You're like, Yeah. yeah. And the show does a good job of being critical of her and not sort of like it in the end, of course she's main character. So everyone loves her and yes. she, she brings everyone together and that's her value. But like it is critical of her in the way of like, she's a fucking selfish brat and everyone is like sick of her shit all the time. <laughs> always sick of shit. But at the end they do acknowledge that like, if, not for her, all of these people would not have been brought together. Exactly. Because she's just so damn outgoing and extroverted <laughs> and rambunctious that she brings people together and she helps them see the flaws in themselves, just like Ash Ketchum from Pokemon. Uh, <laughs> he's just so stupid that he fails upwards. Yep. The and that was the point of Pokemon. Upwards. Yep. And then they ruined it with every subsequent Pokemon from then on after <laughs> And then Jojo. eventually he finally got to be the champion Which of whatever Which defeats the whole point game. of Pokemon! Anyways. <laughs> 20 years later, he finally there got to do it. There was not a linear progression with this character! 
I don't think the 10-year-olds care. Yeah, they don't. I don't. I thought you were um, wrong. Yeah, more about Little Witch I get in. Oh, yeah, the end. Let's get to the ending. Um, well, before we go. Before oh, yeah, we... the twist. We gotta get to the twist. No. Okay. Where before we, we go. <laughs> Where are we going? Where are we going? Can we, we going? talk about the only important male character in the show? Oh, yes. Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> If that even was his name, I That is it. his name. I confirmed it before Andrew. I said that. Andrew. So, uh, as an aside, there is also this, like, very prestigious all-boys school mm. that oftentimes the, the Cavendish family is, like, kind of trying to court because they have a lot of money and political power, and they're trying to obviously, like, extend their reach outside yeah. of the witch community. Even Luna Nova is mm -hmm. trying to impress this academy. It felt like they were going to do a plot with an arranged marriage between Diana and It kind of felt Andrew, like that, and, and then I guess they direction. figured yeah. that was, like, too much. And I like, like that nah, they didn't go there at all. Nah. Which is, yeah, I, I personally really enjoyed that. But that introduces uh, the character of... <laughs> of Andrew, who is the son of, like, someone really, like, a cabinet member in the in the yeah. prime minister's cabinet, I believe. Something and so like that. <laughs> his whole life, you know, he's he's been raised this very particular way. He's been taught that magic is, like, foolishness, and he needs to conduct himself in a way that is befitting of someone who will be a future member of the diet or some yeah. fucking pretentious political bullshit. He's a sticking ass young Republican. That's what he is. <laughs> what he is is a character that, like, the longer you get to know him, the more you're like, if they plucked this character out of Little Witch Academia and put him in Neo Yokio, he would fit right oh, in. Oh, God, He yeah. would fit right in. He could hang out with Kaz Khan, and it would be a delight to watch. He's very Neo Yokio. <laughs> Every time he's on screen, I've got Vampire Weekend in my head. He's so bougie, but he's not bougie in the way that's annoying. He's bougie in the way that is very entertaining, especially yeah. when he plays off of Akko. Throwing who, around uh, Oxford commas left and right. <laughs> who he becomes quite endeared to over the course of the show, and of course Akko rubs off on him and yeah. and shows him that magic uh, can can still have its use in modern society and bring joy and you know ultimately he does uh, he comes around and and then in the pivotal final scene he is there and he's like fuck yeah magic dog and his dad's like damn you right magic though believing in yourself <laughs> is your magic. Believing in yourself who believes in you Believe is your magic. Believe in, in me who believes in your magic. Yeah, That's how it is. There we go. Believing in yourself is your magic. <laughs> On my face. Yeah, he was a great character. Um, I'm glad they didn't go in like an actual romance love story angle at all yeah, at any point not at all. like it's suggested and like characters will tease Akko about like oh you like this boy and, like obviously they have feelings for each other growing but like they don't go in that direction it, at it's all it's not important at it's all. completely take a takes a back seat to Akko and Diana's development like relationship, together yeah. yeah their rivalry slash friendship um, which is great yeah I love it but Andrew is also great so I'm really glad they uh they still included him yeah, and then you have the amazing development. We'll get into the end game spoilers here because I do want to talk about the ending because I have some criticisms of like the last episode, even though I you know I like it, but it's like <laughs> it 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 does a, a big thing. But let's it does okay. a big thing. So you got Ursula and Croy, their development. You get their backstory in terms of like they were best friends in school. Uh, Shiny Chariot got the the fucking wand, the the shit. It has a name uh, that I can't the pronounce. Thingy, the staff. But, uh, yeah, so she was basically the chosen one, you know? Yes. Uh, the fates chose her. Croy was pissed because she really wanted to be the chosen one. She kind of hides this from Shiny Chariot. Because Croy is the one who feels she's more magically competent yeah. and stronger. And she was the Diana of that group, you yes. know? She was, like, the best student. She was so good. She's this fucking prodigy. She's going to change the world of magic. And so Shiny Chariot gets the ability to change the world of magic, and she's like, no, that's bullshit. I don't like it. That's my ability. I don't like it. But yeah, I mean, they're, they're, they're friends for a while, and then you get the sort of backstory in terms of, like, what happened to Shiny Cherry. We finally get that towards the end after she finally explains, I, she explains it to Akko, right? or she explains it to Diana first. Who? And then she explains it to Ursula. Because she sits down and explains it to Diana. Because yes. Diana had figured out because that she Diana wasn't, wasn't is, comes to her and she's like, "Okay, I know you're yeah. shiny chariot." She's like, "I know you're shiny chariot." So she explains to Diana what had happened was, um, shiny chariot was doing her big magic shows uh, to try to inspire people into magic. But then the ratings were going down. They're starting to get stale. The people want more. They weren't flashy enough. And so she's like, damn, how can I become better at magic so I can put on better shows and inspire people? So Croy comes to her and is like, we can use this ability 
where you you siphon the magic from people from their dreams or their their yeah, like you their, siphon their dream magic. their their dream magic like aspirational dreams not literal dreams like <laughs> yeah not their like aspirations asleep. you from her inspiring people she is then able to siphon off their magic to become even stronger and put on bigger shows yes. so shiny chariot interprets this as oh through inspiring the audience they give on to me power and I am able to use that and put on big shows and and everyone loves me and everything is great. What she doesn't know is that she's taking away their magic. Permanently. The magic is drained from them and put into Shiny Chariot and they permanently lose their magic. Um, debatably. Debatably permanently lose their magic. Well, just because <laughs> that's taken from you doesn't mean you can't build it back up. Yeah, and, I think that's and like the she's suggestion. Just, she's like, well, most people, Croy explains, most people don't have that much magic competency anyway, and so mm -hmm. they won't even notice. Yeah, to Croy, it's most people will never use magic. They don't even know they can use magic. So what are... You You're know, not hurting anybody. We're not hurting anyone. Right? We're just taking magic. But Shiny Chariot's whole point is that she's inspiring normal people to get into magic to continue the practice of magic. So she's inspiring all these people. And it turns out that on one of her shows, it was the show where she unveiled this big power and had like the most spectacular show ever. Um, Akko and Diana were both there and they both had their magic taken away by Shiny Chariot. Yes. They were both so, big fans of Shiny Chariot, and they both had their magic yeah. taken by her. And so Croy ends up telling Shiny Chariot what she's been doing, and then she's like, oh, fuck, I can't do this anymore. And so she starts trying to put on her old shows, and people don't like it, and so she goes into hiding, and she becomes a teaser. Because yes. she was ashamed of herself, she couldn't continue doing what she was doing, and the, the guilt was tearing her apart. She... Very much hates herself over You're this. You're tearing me apart, Lisa. That's why she has been a broken person, and she takes on being Ursula. So when Akko comes to the school, Akko tells her about how she was inspired by a shiny chariot thing, and she can't use magic, and Ursula's like, and oh, like, fuck. fuck. <laughs> uh, I definitely took your magic. Oops, my V. Which kind of, you know, now we go back to, like, Akko and her sort of, you know, like, it sort of almost invalidates her, like, oh, well... You can't say that she wasn't trying hard now because she literally had less magic than everyone else. But if she were trying hard enough, she could have got it back like Diana Because did. they prove with Diana that yeah. if she had put the effort into it, yeah. she could have become a badass witch, which so Diana like, still is. She was starting with a disadvantage, but she could have overcome it if she put in the work and she didn't put in enough work, yes. which is kind of like, you know... Tricky. <laughs> it's kind of a bootstrapper message of like, you know, uh, you just gotta put in the work, kid. It doesn't matter if you're inherently disadvantaged. But simultaneously, if you just put in the work, you could be Elon Musk. This is this is a kids show. <laughs> yes. This isn't some fucking yeah. YouTuber a, telling you to buy into Bitcoin. It's not a broad commentary on society. You're not gonna become a billionaire it doesn't overnight have to be for buying perfect. crypto. <laughs> like, let's not. Let's not go too far it with all that. It doesn't have to be perfect. It's messaging for kids. It doesn't have to live up to my fucking uh, socialist perspective or whatever the fuck. The um. message is just, you know, <laughs> even if you naturally feel like you are below everyone around you, if you have the resolve and you put in the work, you can catch up to your peers and at least be as competent, if not perhaps surpass them. Yes, which is true. You can do it. If you believe in your magic, which is believing in yourself. Yes. Believing in myself is my fucking magic. Yes. Um, believe in But yeah, the so magic getting to the ending, uh, the, the twists you. come out. Everyone knows now Shiny Chariot was whatever. Uh, Akko learns and she's, oh, she's devastated. How could this happen? Akko is quite a Damn it. Oh, it turns out my idol was here the whole time lying to me and also took my magic. Uh, <laughs> and also she stole my magic. But ultimately, she forgives Shiny Chariot. Uh, there's a big battle between her, uh, Croy, and Shiny Chariot, and it's fucking dope as shit. That's, like, the best part is fucking them battling. Because uh, <laughs> Croy has made this uh, big uh, uh, kaiju, which is collecting energy so that she can, uh, she steals the rod from Akko, and she's going to open the Grand Triskelion herself, because yes. that's her right is being the baddest bitch in this place. And somehow she presumes that just by opening this thing with her own shiny rod that she created... Well, that... she stole it. Wait, did she get the actual shiny rod? I thought yeah, she, was she had it. Her. She okay. stole it. But she couldn't use it because she didn't have right, the Right, because when words. she gets the Grand Triskelion... No, she has it. She opens it. The Grand Triskelion is that stick. 
Yeah. And she's like, what the fuck am I supposed to do with this? Yes. She exactly. doesn't get it she because can't, she she's can't use it. not meant to use it. Yes. Because she she just thinks that having it will allow her to use the power is right. what I'm trying to All say. All she thinks she is, oh, thought, if I unlock yeah. it, then If I boom. just get the thing, then I can do the thing. But it's it was not made That's for her. That's not how it works. Because she's thinking, like, it will give you the power to change the world. And she's thinking of it in terms of, like... It's like a wish, you know, like, yeah. oh, I'll get this power and then it, it manifests then, in whatever way I think it will. And it's like, that's not what the power is. It's a power that's given to someone who the rod has deemed has the vision to align with the power. The power does w a specific thing. It like, chooses it, a person yeah. for a reason. It chooses them for a reason because it has its own agenda and philosophy, and it's not just like whoever gets it can do whatever yeah. they want. You know, but fuck off whoever can't just use the Grand Triskelion. Um, and so there's there's a bit of like I really liked where they were going with this, and then I liked it less in the final episode because when the like they drank his the Grand Triskelion turns out to be a stick. Yes. And then Akko gets the stick. Yes. It is like, yeah, stick! <laughs> and it's like, she's just doing silly things with it. Like, it's, it seems very established that, like, this is a playful power and it's meant to do silly things. Yes. And so, initially, I'm like, oh, she gets the stick and the stick does silly things. And, like, she's gonna become a shiny cherry to do shows where she does silly things. Because, like, that's what Akko's been all about, is her magic always comes out as, like, she turns into a silly elephant or a mouse or whatever. Yeah, like, she has, she's a flying elephant. And, and I know, thought it all was these a, cute metamorphosis magics that she can use. I thought it would... A great twist that the power of the Grand Triskelion to change the world is through inspiration. And she would do that with very silly magic. And it's, like, in this very... Like, it's not this direct way of saving the world. It's, like, a very very roundabout sort of goofy way of doing it. But then in the last episode, it becomes, uh, we have to stop a nuke. <laughs> the, the evil magic has taken over a nuke in a nuclear submarine and launched it. So, yeah. So basically, Croy's, Croy's big machine that was harvesting negative energy because of the, the big soccer game. Yes. We didn't even Wait, talk about the big soccer yeah. game. But I love this as a framework because, um, like, Croy, the whole time in the background, has been using her magic to. She's been, like, influencing things to piss people off in the world. Yeah, so she's that been they inciting would, people. Yeah. She's been inciting violence, and it's, like, Much it's a like. great societal commentary on, like, the way that, that mm. you know, pe that politicians and whatnot will stoke the flames to get people riled up to be pissed off to start confrontations and so she's been orchestrating these confrontations to feed off of the negative energy and like through her feeding off the negative energy it seems to like amplify people's rage like they get even more pissed off the more this happens i think i'm not uh, sure if it's direct or if it I was think just she's happening just continuously feeding yeah. the feeding the flames of that and like showing people propaganda that makes them more yeah. and more amplified so she's getting uh continuous amounts yeah. of negative energy so we're told that there's like the nation in which the witches are in and there's another nation and they're like at odds like they've always had like a societal like, social sort of struggle between them. Like, maybe there used to be a war. I couldn't remember yeah. exactly. I think like, there's, like, a tenuous a lot of piece. But, yeah, there's a tenuous piece. And so they're, like, at the brink of conflict. And so there's, like, this soccer game going on between the two the nations. <laughs> and basically the, like, the... The ones with all the aristocrats are perceived as being, like, the the fucking oppressors, you know? And, like, the, the other side is the oppressed. And so the referees of the soccer game were unfairly um, doing, like, yellow cards and shit. And there, so that was the perceived slight. Alleged various yes, referees. Alleged ref called, referee blah, blah, blah. misconduct. And Either so it way, became, like, this us versus them thing where it's like, oh, you're... For, for, you so know, the oppressed team ends yeah. up losing... Which incites yeah, violence amongst against both the nation, which sides. Because they're like, how dare you accuse us of cheating? You're cheating. Yeah. Blah, 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 blah. It, but it, it, it goes to show that when, like, tensions are that high, and, like, especially, like, the world of sports often, and on the, the world stage where it's, like, World Cups and shit, it's like... It does get quite yeah, um, They get intense, and they... Passionate. And it feels like those teams are a representation of your people, you know? And so when they're being oppressed in that way, it's like, this shit happens in it's real just, life. Yeah, well, I like, mean, these exactly. games get fucking Riots heated. Riots happen after big, big international sports games all the time. And it was so interesting to see so. them frame it that way of, like... And it's, 
it's it was good to execute the message of the show in a way that was like good enough to be in a kids show where it's like it wasn't like actual people dying in like in it's conflict and genocide seems silly like in the grand yeah. scheme of things but, but it like, still is realistic so i'm glad they went for something that was realistic and works without it being like super edgy you know or like being without like being actual a war, war or like stuff, genocide you know? it was a perfect way for them to illustrate the point without it going too far or or have it be like you know oh p- the police are murdering people in the street of, yeah of it's like Academia. and it's and through Croy's manipulation, obviously that conflict escalated right. to a point she's where she's flo- throwing fuel in the fire. Bad. So um, basically, she ends up harvesting so much negative energy that she, her machine runs amok, and it 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 goes and it hijacks a nuke. Mm-hmm. And now the nuke is coming to uh to blow up uh the the town that they are in, the city that they are in. Yeah. Yes. Oh no! There's a nuke. Yeah, so it's, there's a fucking nuke. Yeah. And everyone in the world is witnessing this, and they're just like, what the fuck do we do? And all the people are panicking and freaking out. And so Akko and the gang are like, we're gonna stop that fucking nuke with magic. It's a magic nuke, we're gonna stop it with magic. And through them stopping it with magic, um, everyone is able to witness this and and become inspired. And sort of, there's a, the big conflict of like, they, they all, like, create a rocket ship of brooms, yeah. and, like, everyone, like, shoots forward, and then each character, like, breaks off after saying something inspirational, and they, they catch up with the the nuke, and then they start battling the nuke in the sky, because the nuke, like, turns into, you know, it all kinds of crazy shit's going all on. All sorts of, you know, now this is the most yeah. trigger thing that yes. happens in this show. And it felt like the, here, we gave you this at the end to be, like, the the hype moment that you were waiting for, you know? (laughs) I personally really liked it. I mean, I loved it. I loved it, but thematically it felt weird to me because it felt like at the end of the second to last episode, the conflict had been resolved and, like, the care... Like, it could have led to... Okay, if, if if it cut to epilogue and we're given the implication that Akko will change the world of magic through inspiring people the way that shiny chariot was and that was the magic all along and and so we've we've made things better through Akko existing and continuing to put faith back in magic that would have been fine for me but what they needed to do plot wise to wrap it up from their perspective was we need to have a big thing to show immediately how Akko's going to inspire everyone to change the world of magic by inspiring everyone by stopping the nuke. It, it accomplishes the same goal, but it goes into like this big ridiculous thing and then she uses the power of the Grand Triskelion to stop the nuke. And so it like it was an awesome uh, explosive magic thing in the end that it's kind of like, oh, I fulfilled my purpose. My purpose all along was to stop a big nuke. And, and you did it. And now I'm gone, you know? <laughs> I mean, I disagree because I feel like the end of the second to last episode was very just like what you would expect from a kid's show. Oh, yeah. I learned my lesson and I got my magic power up and now I'm going to go do my dream. Yes. And then, you know, when you take that and then you you give Akko the hard choice of just like you have this power. And you could use it to follow your dream and go to your big magic shows and make everyone happy, but instead, you're going to sacrifice this thing mm-hmm. that could could just, boom, answer your, give you your dream right then and there. Yeah. And instead, she sacrifices it to protect everyone that she loves. And then, you know, she does kind of have to start from square one, but she's yeah. learned so much okay. that she's going to progress from that much more quickly. Now I completely agree with you. Because so I hadn't as soon as the as, epilogue hits, she, yeah. you see that she learns to fly. I hadn't perceived it as she was sacrificing the great power. She was sacrificing something that could have fulfilled that. her dream instantaneously, yeah. which is huge for her. And that was a big theme throughout the whole thing was... Um, because that was part of when she got the power in the first place, right? Wasn't there an offering of, like... So I was like, you could have this and you could yes. be a witch. And Professor part of the Woodward test. It was the test for um, helping Diana. Her. She's like, if you walk yeah. through this gate, you can you can become like Shiny Chariot, but you have to give up all of your, all your, your past, your yeah, friends, your everything, all those happy things, you have to give them up. And Akko's like, well, no, then it's not worth it. Yes. So this is a continuation on that character arc for Akko. Yeah. Where if she doesn't have those people and she doesn't have those connections, then... Magic doesn't mean anything to her. Yes. 
Which is good. Okay. Now I, so to now me, I agree. Yeah. I really liked that ending. I hadn't perceived her as sacri- like consciously sacrificing yeah, she the She gave up the Grand Triskelion yeah. to protect everyone. Then yes. It's, Knowing it's it would put her Never back mind. in disadvantage. It's perfect. It's, it's great. So and she I did, thought it was really She good. did change the world of magic by inspiring everyone. In, like it, The magic seems to work on Santa Claus rules, where the more you believe in it, the, the, pow- the more powerful yeah. it becomes, and people Definitely. stop believing in it, so it's not being powerful. So now and everyone has seen the power of magic again. And, and so if she had done that, the, the, the higher ups would not have come like they kind of turn yeah. heel and say oh you know what maybe there is a place in our society yeah. for magic. And there's a there's a out with the old in with the new that I love where it's like you see that the newer generation now appre- like it doesn't matter if the old fucks care about magic they are going to be replaced by the younger people who have been inspired and are going to continue to to value it you know. Exactly. And so that was part of the, the in theme that of way, the like Akko fulfills the point of the Grand Triskelion and she yeah. changes the future of magic. You're right. There you go. You were right. And I was wrong. You helped me appreciate the ending of the show. And you're a <laughs> welcome genius, to my anime analysis channel. There you go. I concede. This is this is how discourse is meant to go. <laughs> <laughs> I had a conception, I had a preconception that made me think that I didn't like the ending as much, and then you told me one little thing that changed everything, and now I love it, and it's perfect, so never mind. This is how discussions are meant to be held. Happy life, I happy life, am I and right? and agree, because you are right, <laughs> and now I love the show even more. So hey, that was Little Witch Academia. <coughs> oh, oh, all right. <laughs> the liquid gold. <coughs> it betrays you. <coughs> it betrayed me. <coughs> so, <coughs> I think despite this one kind of being uh, being eschewed for being a kids show and kind of being cast aside for not being like Gurren Logan, I think it has a lot to offer. It's, yeah, it's first great. of all visually it's also it's gorgeous to look at it's super comfy and fun if you don't feel like uh you know like really <laughs> paying attention you can put the dub on the dub is pretty good it's on netflix yeah we watched a dub it was we great. watched a dub it was pretty good um it, it's as comfy as watching pokemon but it has uh enough so much heart and uh, and stuff to to kind of show you and keep you invested and interested mm-hmm. i mean i would give it like a solid nine for That's me personally like eight yeah it's pretty good pretty good mm. it's a lot of fun so uh hey <clears throat> if this all sounds good and maybe we've maybe we've swayed your opinion on little witch academia that'd be great i hope so go check it out on netflix uh, it's a lot of fun. Give it another shot if it sounds good. It's a good. gaff. It's a you can not give it another shot and stay out of the discourse. <laughs> discourse, I'm howling at the moon. 